Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, ranking member Slaughter, for your leadership and your dedication to bringing legislation to the floor. And uh, it all happens here. I, I just was saying hello to Mr. Camp, Chairman Camp, outside, and and extending my prayers to him. He's such a fine, lovely person. Yes, we we've, we've extended that to him. Will be fine. So to relieve the stress in his life, to take it easy. And so mm -hmm. I hope that uh, this passage of this uh, legislation will uh, contribute to that uh, uh, peace. I was listening attentively, both when I was in the room and when I was not in the room, but hearing it on TV, as the chairman, distinguished chairman said, uh, the cameras in the room, to some of the questions and observations that were being made uh, by members and by our uh, distinguished chairman, Mr. Camp, and ranking member, uh, Mr. Levin. And I thought, you know, we're sitting at this table, and around this time across our country, people are sitting at their kitchen tables having dinner, finishing dinner, and part of what they will be talking about is how they are going to make ends meet. How do middle-income families in our country address the uncertainty that they see in our economy? And uh, as I listened to Mrs. Fox's, uh, Con uh, Congresswoman Fox's questions about growth, and I heard the chairman say that growth was so important, I think it is important to go back to some of the history that Mrs. Fox uh, asked about of uh, Mr. Levin. And that is to say that in 1993, we passed uh, of an economic bill that did uh, increase taxes. Uh, we needed revenue, and we needed growth, and we needed to reduce our deficit. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, so there was an occasion where uh, increase in taxes created an atmosphere where the private sector, where most of these jobs are created, could, could create over 20 million jobs and take the deficit down to a place where it was on a trajectory of $5.6 trillion be in surplus, which quickly was turned around under a new president, President Bush, with Bush tax cuts and other things like the uh, Medicare prescription drug bill and two unpaid for wars, but just starting with the tax cut, which turned that around to a $5.5 trillion trajectory to deficit. An $11 trillion swing, Mr. Hoyer knows these facts and figures better than anybody, $11 trillion swing, so unheard of uh, in our country. And so, I, I reference it here because you asked, Mrs. Fox, but also because you're asking us to go right back to where, how we got in this fix in the first place. Tax cuts at the high end, which do not create jobs, which increase the deficit. And on top of it, took us to a brink of recession, as well, a deep recession, as well as a meltdown of our financial institutions. That lack of revenue that sprang from uh, the financial institution meltdown contributed to the deficit as well. So that's where the deficit came from. Tax cuts for the wealthy, giveaway on the Medicare prescription drug bill, two unpaid for wars, meltdown of the financial services industry, therefore reduction in revenues coming in to the Treasury. Some disagreement on what, what supervision should have been there or not. But I don't think there's any disagreement, as Mr. McGovern said, on the fact that we all think middle-income Americans should have a tax cut. Those making up to $250,000 a year should get a tax cut. If we just pass what we agree on, and that's what people don't understand, why can't you just do what you agree on and then continue the conversation on the rest? $250,000. Now, what does that do? Between 250 and above, you save. If you go down this path the president is proposing, you save a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars, or you borrow a trillion dollars from the Chinese and others in order uh, to fund that debt. But let's get back to that kitchen table. What does that mean to me if I'm a middle-income person in our country or a senior or a person trying to put, put families through schooling? The uncertainty as to their 
their job, their income, their, uh, their, uh, whether they're going to be able to send their kids to college, whether they're going to hold on to their home, the value of their pensions, it, ha it means everything. Because the uncertainty that is out there for the economy brings uncertainty to that kitchen table. Kitchen table. And in order to, cre to reduce the deficit, I believe you do have to have growth. So we want to be, uh, watch our investments carefully so they produce jobs, help create jobs, help the private sector create jobs. Also, that brings revenue to the Treasury. Now, at $250,000 a year, the money that is uh, in the pocket now of the um, uh, middle-income people is money that they will spend. They will in spend that money. They will inject demand into the economy, and it will create jobs, jobs for them, jobs for them. What it also does is takes a trillion dollars that we don't have to go further into debt by giving tax cuts to the high end and don't have to borrow, as I say, from China and other lenders uh, adding to the deficit. So I, it's hard to explain to anybody why we can't, okay, you agree on this. We also agree we have to have, and Stanley's been singing this tune forever, that we have to have tax fairness and tax simplification. We have to address the tax code in a that, that is bipartisan, is nonpartisan, really, but does the right thing for our country. I'm going to yield to him in a moment. I, I keep referencing him because he's been such a champion on fiscal soundness, fair taxes. And fairness, as you mentioned, Mr. McGovern, that's really an issue for our country. It is the theme of America, the most enduring theme, the American dream. And that's predicated on fairness and taking responsibility for each other from one generation to the next. So I come before the committee to respectfully request your consideration of the uh, alternatives that Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Levin presented earlier, which said, here's a place where we are all in agreement. We all agree that there has to be a middle income tax cut. Whatever else we have, we can continue that conversation later. But do not hold a middle income tax cut hostage to giving tax cuts to the high end, do not create jobs, increase the deficit, inje continue uh, 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 injecting uncertainty into the economy, which is not a healthy thing for the economy, for businesses, and for uh, uh, America's working families. It's a, it's a, it's a bill that the CBO says 97% of small business won't be affected by it. I think even Mr. Speaker Boehner has conceded that point. So this is about um, most small businesses in our country. When people come up with that as saying we can't give middle income tax people something because the vectors of the world, which are defined as a small business for some reason or other, won't get a tax cut. But in any event, uh, let's do what we all agree on. Let's give the middle and class families a break. I just want to show you one chart, and then I'm going to yield to Mr. Horn. The, uh, the difference between our two bills are as follows. This gives a middle income tax cut to those making up a, a, a middle income tax cut to those making up to $250,000. Under the GOP plan, people making over a million dollars a year, Mr. Wardall, if you made a million dollars a year, you would get $160 thousand dollars an average you and your friends would get an average of hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year in a tax break under the Republican plan and in order to help pay for that middle-income families would on average have to pay thousand dollars more so not only are we borrowing to cover this we're taking from the middle class to give this tax cut at the high end it's just not fair. And so I urge your consideration of uh, uh, what Mr. Levin uh, came in and spoke for, which is what the president's proposal that is fair. Well, thank you. That creates thank jobs. Thank you very and much. Yield back my thank, time. thank you very much uh, for that, Ms. Pelosi.